So to begin, to begin our, our, our session today, I would like to welcome Darlene Daniel from Kong to lead us in prayer. Go ahead, Darlene. I am going to do the Lord's Prayer in Yupik. If you all can uh, join. today. Our first presentation will be led by Winter Montgomery, the Tribal Justice Attorney. Winter will present to you the AVCP Model Children's Code. Her presentation begins on page two of your program material labeled day three. Welcome, Winter. And remember, you have to press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you, Denise. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. I know I'm not even in a uh, a room actually uh, presenting in front of you, but I am standing up. I'm ready to go. I got a I got the afternoon uh, where I need to get more active here after lunch break. So we are so excited to announce uh, that we uh, sent out the children's code. Uh, our promise was to get it before 20. 20 came and it happened uh, in December of 2019, but we did it. Um, so if you haven't received that, we sent a copy to all of the tribes, uh, the first uh, one of many in a series of model codes. Uh, we're going to be following up on a, a survey this fall uh, to give it about a year after it was first distributed on what tribes uh, have adopted it, whether it be a version the full code or version. And just so you know, uh, we don't get hurt feelings if uh, it, that you take part of the code, but then you rewrite portions to make it uh, more uh, impactful in your community. That's great. That's what we want you to do. So uh, it's just a guide, and, and we want it to be there uh, to be helpful, but it's not required. And uh, if you have your own code that's working really well, then then keep using that. But this is to go over the model code uh, that we have and see if it's something, if your tribe doesn't have a code or you want a revision, um, this is an option. So I'm going to go, starting on the slide, so we'll go through an overview, overview of the code, the foundation of the code, the different code sections, some of the highlights of the code, amendment options, uh, that's to add certain items that are relevant to your community, and then the benefits of adopting it uh, because you'll have some un uniformity with some of our forms. They'll kind of line up with the, uh, the code. So the foundation of the code is the language. I'm still amazed that, you know, when I moved here 10 years ago, Yupik is the second most spoken native language in the United States after Navajo. This is really impressive. So if that, if people are speaking the language, we need to put the codes uh, in, the lang in the language. And some of the tribal judges that we've, as uh, Denise was talking about, we travel out to villages uh, based on requests and, and go over um, items that the community has asked us to. Sometimes we'll bring interpreters or have um, somebody translate because a lot of the tribal judges you know, they're usually elders and well-versed in tradition, and they're usually Yupik uh, first speakers. So it's important to have the code in a language that that the judges are comfortable interpreting, and so they can apply 
the traditional laws in the original language. So uh, this is a quote that I I uh, had from Alice Fitka from Tunt. Uh, I saw it. Uh, they were doing a story in KYUK about the significance of language, and I just I really liked the quote, so uh, I wanted to share it. Our language is like a rope. And if you look at a rope, if you take it apart, it has many strands in there. It's what makes it strong. If it was just a skinny strand, it couldn't pull a sled. It can't tie a boat down. Our language is like that rope. It, it has how to raise a child. It tells us how to be, how to preserve food, how to prepare food, all in Yupik. So I just, I uh, wanted to share that. So that's what we're trying to do at ABCP. We're trying to uh, make codes that are in the language and embody the culture. We know that language is a, a huge part of that. The next slide, we talk about Western codes versus traditional codes. And so I'm not going to uh, read everything off, off the slide, but you're uh, more than welcome to go back and, and look at uh, some of those items. But basically, as you know from the beginning, when uh, with the Western codes and uh, Western civilization telling Native uh, communities, hey, your ways aren't good enough, this is our way, this is the best way, we know that because uh, of grandparents that were sent to boarding school that were, were taught to speak English and forget about their language and their ways. So there was this push the same way with the Western codes that you should adopt templates that look like uh, like a state or federal code, that way, that, that means you're legitimate, you're a real court, if your court looks like our court. Now we're seeing that a lot of those uh, Western ways don't work in, in tribal communities. And actually, the traditional ways of doing um, circle healing, restorative justice, that are all uh, ideas that, that, that come from traditional courts and the way of dealing with problems in communities, uh, the Western world is actually saying, hey, those ways are actually better than the adversarial process, some of the stuff that we're doing in state and federal court. So they have actually were taking uh, the ideas from traditional Native communities and trying to make therapeutic courts and other restorative justice courts using those principles. So, so we're seeing that tribal traditional ways are not just the ways that, that your community uses and is good. It's actually something, an example to the world and to the rest of the United States and their courts that that these ways do work and, and it's an example to others. So just like I was talking about yesterday, we uh, keep doing what you're doing, take pride in, in the traditional ways uh, of your community. So the start of the code, uh, and someone actually brought up something to me, and I, I like the idea. It will take some time, but uh, it first has English, and then it has old Yupik. Uh, we have a modern Yupik translation now, so what we'll do is we'll add that one as well. Someone mentioned, you know, it sh we should go put the uh, modern Yupik first, and then the old Yupik, and then the English, and I like that idea. So, Denise, I'll talk to you about that later, <laughs> but that'll... Um, just kind of with the codes that you're always revising, you're always trying to make it better, but we're just trying to um, get things out to the to the community so they can use it as soon as possible. But if we do that revision, um, then we'll obviously send everyone a copy so then they can um, adopt that as well. And that probably will be done here in the next month or two, um, adding modern UPIC uh, and then having it looked over by um, a translator that that has expertise in the that um, area. Okay, so when you'll yeah, so when you see the children's code that came out, it will have English, old Yupik, and then here in a couple of months, modern Yupik. We have the code in sections uh, going through the findings and purpose, definitions, jurisdiction, uh, the laws that apply how they're going to be enforced, and then the different sections, whether it be child protection or child custody, adoption, uh, so that way it's easy to follow along. I have seen traditional codes that are more an, of a narrative, and that's fine too. Um, this is just um, how ours is set up. 
but I have seen traditional codes where it's just like, this is the purpose, uh, this is what we're going to do, this is the procedures, and if we want to change it, you know, we have authority to do an amendment later. So uh, it doesn't have to be sectioned out. Uh, it can be a narrative, too. All right. And the next slide talks about highlights of the code. Uh, that's just kind of highlighting that we have uh, the different definitions in, in English and in Old Yupik, uh, and to kind of have the original meaning uh, with the Old Yupik uh, before translation. Uh, the next slide, same thing, continuing on, that, that goes through uh, an example of a, the procedure. So this here would be in a, for a child protection case, and there was an adjudication hearing, um, and the court was deciding if uh, the child was a child in need of aid, and just some of the procedures that go with that, what's the purpose of the hearing, uh, the time limit to have the hearing, notice, making sure the parents or custodians of the, the children uh, are able to participate and invited, given the opportunity to be heard uh, if, uh, if they choose at that hearing, and having notice of when the hearing will be uh, so they can attend. Uh, the next section, how evidence will uh, be heard and collected from witnesses and other and other mechanisms, uh, and then finally the decision uh, by the court. One of the benefits of adopting AVCP code, uh, children's code, is that a lot of the forms, like here, I put a, a slide of the adopt one of the notice of hearings for an adoption. So a lot of the notices and the universal forms that we have and that was given out at uh, not last training, the training before. But if you ever want a thumb drive of the uh, updated forms, um, I can usually people message me. I just email it to them. But if there's a large amount or you want all of them, we handed out a thumb drive with um, quite a bit of the different uh, updated forms, uh, you can ask for that and I can mail that to you as well. So those are the options. So I think that's one of the, the, the best part of the, the code is that it kind of lines up with the forms that a lot of the tribal courts are using and so then it, it kind of um, lines up with the uh, uniformity. But as I said, it doesn't, if, if your tribe is doing a, using your own forms, uh, that, that's great. Uh, we also have a plan of putting the forms so that it can be uniform with the rest of our codes uh, in three languages or two languages, depending if we have um, access to Old Yupik uh, translation or not. One of the reasons the Children's Code was in Old Yupik is because one of the, the earlier uh, codes we had was uh, done by some elders, and they put it in Old Yupik, so that, that was kind of using the original form, then to translate it from there to modern Yupik, and then to English, so having the meaning. So for some uh, of the upcoming codes, if we have the old Yupik, we will incorporate that. But if it wasn't originally in old Yupik, modern Yupik, then it will be in English. So um, if you're wondering why some things will be in three languages and some will be um, in two. Oh shoot, I missed uh, slide 10. I, I just wanted to bring up that if you if your tribe does adopt the model code, uh, it has a section for amendment options. So if you really like the code, but there's a couple things that are missing that your tribe does and wants to include, then there's uh, an ability to amend it and add sections uh, that you think are relevant. So here's just an example, uh, some some tribes have like a, el a court of elders uh, or a community c uh, committee, such as like in a child protection case, there's the tribal judges that make the decision, but they might cite, uh, they might meet with community members that have ideas about um, of what 
what's best for the children or uh, that family or other input. Or some communities have a court of elders. They might not be the actual tribal judges, but they are the experts in traditional uh, ways. And so if there's a question, the, the court thinks they have a decision, but they're not quite sure how the applicable traditional way would apply, then they could consult the court of elders or a group of elders to ask them, hey, we were going to do this. Uh, we wanted to follow circle healing, but we're not quite sure how that works. Or um, we have a question about uh, what we should do, what was the traditional way to deal with something like this in the past. So. Uh, those are options too. So it's all about going back to making it fit your community. If you do want to adopt it, how you can add things that are relevant for your community. All right. So uh, yeah, I just want to conclude by saying we're we're really excited about the work that that we're doing. We have a long way uh, to go, but we're we're just happy uh, that we can be part of this process and. We love input from the tribes, even how someone messaged me, hey, we should, in the code, you know, put Yupik first, then English. You know, I, I like that suggestion. I think that that I, I should do that. So we're always open to uh, suggestions and ideas, and I hope that we're collaborative with, with communities. So that's kind of the short version of what the, the Children's Code uh, is about. And if you don't have a copy, Go ahead, W Montgomery at avcp.org. I have my email right, right there on the slide and then my direct line. Give me a call and I can get it to you. If you have any other ideas, uh, we, we appreciate it. And I, just as I said yesterday, we're working on uh, a model, minor offense code, clerk's manual, bench book, and then a juvenile healing circle uh, process that we that is another thing on the docket so all right thank you if you have any questions uh give me a call or um ask them right now that'd be great thanks winter so avcp as winter said we do have our model children's code and like she said please reach out if you need it we're always here to help i would like to open the floor for questions to winter regarding the children's code Please remember to press star six to unmute yourself so that we can hear your question. Um, are there any questions or comments out there? Okay, so hearing no questions, I would like to go ahead and inform Oh, go ahead. This is Daisy May. Hi, Daisy. Thank you for your, thank you for your presentation. It, it's very specific. I'd like to ask you. You mentioned something about juvenile code and in those development of codes. I don't know if this question will fit, but I will take a leap and ask: Is there an existing memorandum of agreement with all tribal? Councils uh, in regards to the service delivery for youth and juvenile uh, healing circle, which is totally different and opposite from adult uh, plans for restoration. Is there a specific documentation in place, a plan that we can consider for? Our code adoptions. Hi, this is Winter. Great question. So, the, we do a lot of trainings with uh, Department of Juvenile Justice, and they are very open to the diversion program. And they are currently uh, working with tribes in our community. If you don't have an agreement with DJJ, they have all the paperwork. They will send it to the the tribal. Uh, Council and do that agreement. They're usually pretty open to having the community take uh, take over the case. So I'm not sure the exact numbers. I could I could probably ask 
DJJ and then follow up with an email to let you know how many communities are engaging in that. Uh, basically that process is they, the state and the tribe agree that they're going to transfer the jurisdiction to the uh, tribal community where the youth is from and then the tribal court takes over the case and um, take, make sure that the youth gets any treatment that's needed, follows up with the family, maybe they do a, a version of the healing circle, maybe they do a hearing and then have the youth do community work service in the community um, as part of the, the, the sentence process. Uh, there is also a way where this, the case could stay in state court and then the, but the youth could do uh, treatment with elders. I've seen agreements where it stays in the state court, but part of the sentence is that they, re, you know, they return to the community and they do so many hours of elder counseling, community work service, that sort of thing. Um, and that is usually done when the child, maybe they were already adjudicated in the state court, so they're like on juvenile probation, but they don't, so when they have like a probation violation, the state might say, hey, the youth can stay in the community, but they have to follow through with these other items uh, or uh, to avoid, you know, being removed and going to like a state treatment or something like that. So it's definitely a possibility to have the case handled in, in tribal court. I also wanted to add to that, this is Denise. Um, I don't know that we, we don't have a count of tribes who are doing intertribal courts right now, but what you're asking, you know, the MOA between tribes, um, that is something that's possible um, to have that intertribal court with, you know, I want to call on Estelle because I know she's doing intertribal courts um, in the Pine Mute, Hooper Bay, Scammon, Chivac region. Um, but that that's a possibility um, that the tribes could do with uh, government to government agreements for intertribal courts. Yes, um, madam, thank you for that response. I, I have my very specific reason of asking and posing this question based on one great concern I have in my heart. We are um, addressing juvenile issues. I feel we have yet to address traditional treatment, traditional services for children anywhere from adolescent to their teens. And the model that specifically would be a prevention model providing traditional services for the children that are going through trauma. In my thought, when there's any issues within a home setting, a child anywhere from the time they're, they're conceived to birth, from birth to the time that they're experiencing challenges and issues, it it seems that just one way of treatment program may not work and fit for the child uh, when it's referred to, let's say, mental health program, when there should be a tra existing traditional services program for these children where, where I, it just seems that, and I'm excited, that teenagers and adults are being serviced. And at the same time, I tend to also not forget, but to embrace the thought of what about these little children, especially if they're placed outside of the tribe or outside of um, the home unit that's not within family settings or family structure. I'm thinking in Yupik, and I'm trying not to integrate the Yupik concept because speaking it in English takes the context out of what I'm really meaning to say. Daringutin, do you understand? Yeah, I understand. Um, so I'm really happy that you brought that up because something that I really try to do is advocate for our Healthy Families program. Um, they do take referrals from tribal courts. If 
the tribe knows because you know in our in our communities everybody knows what's going on um our our tribal judges our tribal court staff they know you know what what happens within their community and a resource for each of our tribal courts is our AVCP Healthy Families program, which really does incorporate the cultural aspect of healing. Um, and their focus, one of their main focuses is juveniles. Um, and this, you know, I, I'm not exact. I know that OCS um, does do referrals to the Healthy Families program, and they consider that a treatment option um, in their in their cases. Um, but I you know, I just have to put it out there that our Healthy Families Department does take referrals from tribal courts for, um, you know, whatever case, you know, if you have a family that they're having issues and they need they need treatment, um, that, that's an option for you. But our, our Healthy Families does, one of their main focuses is juvenile cases. Um, so if, if you need more information on that, please reach out to me and I can get you that information. Um, I, I appreciate, oh. Excuse me. I appreciate the uh, focus on the juveniles. I'm I'm still searching for an answer in regards to the infants. From infants, I I believe they go through trauma. And is there a plan or a program in place that can give up services? for these little children? And if there isn't, can there be a memorandum of agreement amongst the tribal councils or tribal courts to give up one or have one in an existing plan? So I think, sorry, I had to check if I was muted. <laughs> um, I, I think that it is possible for tribes to develop a plan in addressing issues with juveniles and with the little, you know, the tiny babies, the infants. Um, and I, you know, I, I could dig more into this and get back to you, um, but definitely that's a great idea and that's a great concept. I understand what you're saying. Um, hi, this is Estelle. Um, yeah, you, uh, as far as like the intertribal stuff goes, yes, you can put whatever you want to within the the confines of that agreement. Um, what we have in our our basic agreement is is pretty simple, but you can get as 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 uh, specific as you want to, especially when it comes to dealing with children. Um, one of the tools that I use and I refer to kind of frequently um, because there's not a whole lot written that I've found about um, restorative justice for children. There's actually a research um, review that was done by an organization called the West Ed Justice and Prevention Research Center and um, it talks mainly about restorative justice in schools um, and how to implement those programs. But one of the things that I really liked um, about this information that I got from there, there's actually um, something called a restorative justice implementation guide and toolkit. And they have different examples from all, of, all over the country on how they uh, apply um, our principles of uh, helping to build our children back up and give them tools to communicate better and um, to work with each other uh, more effectively. Um, I didn't see anything in there about um, babies per se, but um, I can definitely look at some of my resources also and share those with Denise and um, the rest of you folks. I, I'm sure Denise can get that information out, but again, um, uh, the organization is called the West Ed Justice and Prevention Research Center. Um, they have um, a bunch of information. They did a bunch of stuff with with uh, students in Chicago. I know it's definitely very different than than um, our area of Alaska and Southwest Alaska, but they have information and tools that we can look at and apply. And that's kind of what I've been working on is looking at all these different tools and seeing okay, how does this apply in a traditional uh, setting and with our um, cultural values and standards? Um, I think 
Daisy, I would really love to talk to you more about this and um, what you're thinking about, because um, I, I definitely agree. We have, I think, the, the majority of our cases, when we look at justice, we can spend more time, I think, if we spent more time in prevention and support services for our children and our families, we wouldn't have the problems that we we have right now with um, with people going in and out of jail, the recidivism rates, and and also you know some of the abuse patterns that we have in our communities. So um, I'll I'll be glad to share whatever I have with you guys. Thank you, Estelle. I would I would love those resources. Um, Daisy, I hope that helps to answer your question. I know it wasn't a complete answer, but we're we're gonna be working on it. You've got you've you've planted the seed. Are there any more questions or comments? Yes, I'm 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 grateful for what I'm receiving as responses. Um uh, I think when we look at today's timing compared to our times, we're beginning to see even infants and toddlers being sexually abused. There, there's there's this, this very reason of why I'm posing this question and um, seeking and asking what can we do, how can we best approach this, how can we give up this? Do we have an existing program that can assist the family, particularly more the child? So, Koyana Chakna for answering. You're welcome. Thank you, Estelle. Again, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments before we move on? So hearing none, um, I'd like to go ahead and move on Hello. to the next. Oh, hi. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, Fritz from Kipnuk. We have a children's coat. Um, I don't know if you could identify it, but it's ordinance number 93-13. I don't know if that came from AVCT or not. Maybe this looks like it was um, I was just wondering if this came, if that sounded familiar and if it came from AVCP. So the the code is uh, based in my original presentation um, from November is we took parts of uh, the Kipnuck code and a couple other codes and merge them together. So the code, yeah, looks uh, very similar to uh, Kipnuk because they were the ones that had an, uh, one that was originally in Old Yupik. Uh, so we wanted the original translation and then uh, put in the English translation and then we're um, working on getting modern Yupik as part of it. So yes, they're very similar to, to Kipnuk uh, and Angela, um, with requests from from Angela, yeah. Okay, okay, that that's all. Yeah. Thanks. So I just want to be sure that I'm giving everybody enough time to unmute themselves and um, be able to ask the questions that they have or say state the comments that they have. Are there any last comments or questions? Uh, Denise? Hi. Hello. Gladys. Hi. Hi. Uh, from Cooper Bay. Um, about that lady with the children having uh, incidents with her infants, um, we had one incident deal thing, and what we did was we filled out an emergency uh, temporary emergency custody, and it worked out, and it's still going on right right now, on and off about the custody and and with the juveniles. Um, when we have when we have court with them, we always ask them um, 
if they're involved in uh, social activities, and we always suggest them to go to behavior health, and we have a women's shelter opened up now, and you know they could participate over there, try to help out, do community service over there, or any of the offices, you know, the juveniles. We we try to let them do community service, you know, get them out of out of uh, what's going on in in them. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Are there any last mm, last questions or comments? Uh, I have a question. This is Susie Edmund. Um, are there any codes that require um, a person or a child who has gone through trauma to receive services? Um, I ask that because we know that uh, a lot of people who go through trauma don't have opportunity or don't receive services to deal with their experience and and then um, as they continue it comes out in behavior um, and causes issues. So is there any codes um, that require a person who's gone through trauma to receive services? So I'm going to call on um, Winter or Alex if you're on the phone. Sure, this is Winter. I can respond. So you can add that as part of your code uh, if there's certain treatment that you believe that a youth would need or a child that suffered suffered trauma. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be a court case if you know if there's an issue in the community. Uh, I think a lot of times how things start in state or federal court is usually a complaint or something that's going on. Uh, but if your community is more preventative uh, and just wants uh, to offer treatment to a youth, uh, you can do that. Uh, yeah, well, it might not be binding on them to participate unless there's, like, some kind of open case. Um, but there's still preventative efforts that, that the tribe could do. If you want to make it specifically in your code, you can add that section uh, about mandatory treatment and traditional healing or whatever uh, portion of treatment that you do want for the youth. Thank you, Winter. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Okay. So I'm going to ask one more time if there are any last questions or comments before moving on. So then moving forward, um, I just want to remind everybody that if you have unmuted yourself. Hello. Um, hi. This is Julia. Hi, Julia. Um, it, it's very good to hear about what we can do for the young people, even during um, conception or when they conceive uh, uh um, even a pregnant woman, um, is this code similar to what um, ECWA holds for? Because many times I to hear um, trauma and how substance abuse, all the violence that are happening to our youth and to the family, to the community. Um, it's really sad to hear 
that um, we're so used to the outsiders coming in and taking over, but not empowering our people to resolve our own problematic issues in our villages when we have a lot of resources. Um, and it was really good to hear about ECWA. Um, one of their codes or law has some intervention prevention that's related to our culture and to our tradition in helping people. But is this also applies to ECWA code? I'm just wondering about that. Thank you. Hi, this is Winter. So the ICWA uh, cases are usually in the state court, and then the Indian Child Welfare Act will apply in those cases. The the children's code uh, that's applied in your community is when you have jurisdiction and you're handling the case on your own without the state. So there might be some principles that are similar, but uh, you can intervene in the state case, as, you're, as you were talking about, uh, and be a party, either um, as, a tr as a representative for the tribe or through partnership with uh, Alaska Legal Services or Alaska Native Justice Center has lawyers uh, that represent tribes in state court, or uh, the, code, the code is for courts that are tribal courts that are doing uh, the case on their own. So it either started in uh, tribal court or it went to, it was in state court and then got transferred to tribal court. So it's when they have the full authority over the case. So that's what, that's what this one is. But good question because there are some similarities uh, based on those, those cases. And then the code also has uh, ICWA mostly deals with child protection in the state court, but the code t goes through child protection and then uh, also has adoption uh, in there and then child custody. So it has some ex other parts to it uh, that are more expansive than just ICWA. Okay. So now, thank you, Winter. I appreciate your answer back to Julia. And, um, you know, that that is a really good question. I clarified that. Um, we'd like to move into the um, round robin. The It's a round robin regarding code drafting. And I would like to welcome Clay Venitas, Darlene Daniel, and Winter Montgomery to go ahead with their presentation. Their presentation will begin on the end of today's program material. Um, I know on your agenda it states but she has and Please remember to press star six to go ahead and mute yourself. <laughs> this is um, it looks like my, <clears throat> my slides, the first one on page 14 of <clears throat> the handout. So I can start if that works. Um, and I'll, I'll move, I'll try to move in a clear way, though I, I think I have 15 minutes, maybe less now um, to do it, but I'll, uh, I'll move in a clear way. And I'm, I'm trying to, for my presentation, I'm just gonna focus on, um, on a specific type of code to draft. Um, and I think that's the point of this workshop is in round robin is to, to get a flavor of drafting a specific type of code that all three of us um, are going to talk about. So my the title of mine says, Ensuring Your Court Gives Proper Notice. Um, so this is going to be about drafting a, a code in, you know, and you can call it an ordinance 
because it's a specific, um, it's a specific uh, law that you can put into your tribal code, in your tribal court code. Um, so the first slide is what is proper notice? And I think everybody uh, is getting a good understanding of that based on um, Kevin's presentation on uh, the first day of this workshop. So I won't spend much time here, but again, it's every person interested in the case knows about the case and how they can respond and where and when the hearing is. Um, there are different types of notice. You can do personal service, which means somebody hands the papers or hands the notice uh, to the person that is interested in the case. Or you could do things by certification. Um, or, or, you know, there are other forms of service. It doesn't that um, the requirements for service are not necessarily spelled out. There aren't necessarily specifics. There are ways the state does it, um, but there are other ways to do it, and I will get into that. So the next slide says, why ensure proper notice? Um, first of all, it's just the right thing to do. It gives everybody a fair chance to participate. I think that um, um, it's important to coming to a solution. It's not really about, you know, covering covering yourself, you know, and making sure everybody knows. that you want people to be involved because then everybody's voices are heard and and you come to a solution and an agreement rather than um, rather than just a judgment against somebody. And the other reason is it's a key requirement of due process in the Indian Civil Rights Act, as Kevin discussed, um, notice is a requirement. So this, my short presentation is about how to write a code that will meet the requirements of the Indian Civil Rights Act. Um, so the next slide says how to write a code on notice. Step one, putting the code in the right place. Um, a good place to put this in your code um, in your tribal court code, I, I put an example, is where your code explains how to start a case. So if your tribal court code, or if you want to write your new codes, a good, play, a good um, section to have is telling people how to open a case in tribal court, whether that means, you know, writing a petition and telling the tribal court, I would like to have a hearing, I would like to meet with the judges and resolve a matter. Well, in that place in your code, it's good to put in a requirement um, for proper notice at that place so that when somebody, so it makes it, it's like, it should be like reading a book. Um, what you don't want to have to be jumping around the code to find how to follow it. It should be simple and easy. And I think a good way for it to be that is if it if right where it shows you in the code how to open a case, it also provides the requirements to provide proper notice to the other parties. Now moving on to step two, assigning responsibility for giving notice. So in state court in Alaska, the person who opens the case has the responsibility for providing notice and proving to the court that they've done that. That's not necessarily the best way to do things. Um, especially in a smaller community, it helps everybody sometimes if the court clerk is responsible for providing notice. Of course, that puts more work on the court clerk um, and less on the person opening the case. But to the extent the court clerk ha is starting to become an expert on the issues and knows how to, or at least an expert on how to move the case forward, it is sometimes a good idea to have in your code that it is the court clerk's responsibility to get this notice to the other party so that the person who's opening the case doesn't have to try to figure that out themselves. But it's up to you how you want to write that. Um, the next step is, and I will go over an example of this code at, at, in the last of my slides, and we'll and we'll show you in this code every every one of these steps as an example. So you'll see an example if that's helpful to you. So the next uh, slide says so step three: stating who gets notice. This needs to be the respondent. It needs to be the person who um, who the case is being brought against. 
um, and all interested parties. Anybody you think that would be interested in the outcome of this case, that this case affects, should be given notice, and you should put that in the code stating exactly who it, it is, who the court clerk is required to give notice to. In child welfare cases, like ICWA cases, that's, you know, that's pretty broad. Notice is, um, and that's spelled out in ICWA, um, who should be given this. And so um, that's something to check on, and it's helpful to put in your code so that when your court clerk um, or whoever is providing notice is going to do notice, you should make it very easy for them to know exactly who to send um, notice to. And a lot of times, tribal court codes will say, will require that the person who's opening the case, when they write their petition to open the case and ask for a hearing, a lot of tribal court codes will require that that person include the names and numbers, phone numbers or addresses of everybody who they think is involved and that they think should get notice to make things easier for the court clerk to give notice. So that's another example too, is to give it, to share a bit of the responsibility and give uh, and require whoever's opening the case to give the court some information on who needs to be given notice. So step four is defining how to give proper notice. And then this is kind of, you know, this is the real bread and butter here. Um, I have an example and a quote, you know, the court clerk shall give notice by, and then you, and then you include the methods of giving notice. And you have to define what type of notice is enough, what counts as giving enough notice, because you can understand if you posted, if your first step was to post a piece of paper somewhere, um, saying, hey, there's here, you have a court, this person has a court date, and you got to show up, you, you should show up to it. If you, you know, just putting that maybe on the, on the outside of the building that where the tribal court is probably not enough. So just the no notice has to be designed to, to actually get to the person who needs to see it. You don't have to go overboard. It, you, you know, you just have to do something reasonable. So I'll get into that. Based on court, Alaskan court cases where they've discussed notice requirements and what is sufficient, it turns out what is actually sufficient is not the specific type of notice. It's doing everything you can, certain means that are reasonably designed to notify the person that a hearing is coming up, that the case has been opened. And that takes in all circumstances. So if you have a small village, if there are certain ways in your village that you get um, that you get news to each other, you can try you can do that and you can document that. And then that would be considered notice. It was reasonably designed in light of the circumstances of your the true the traditions of your village make it so that was well designed to give the person notice. Again, it doesn't mean the person that, like, doesn't mean there necessarily has to be an absolute requirement that it gets into the person's hand. You just have to do everything that is reasonably likely to get that person notice. So that's kind of wishy-washy, but it also, the thing about that is it means it leaves things open to tailoring notice to how your community might provide that notice. So, it's, so whereas the state courts require specific types of giving notice, personal service, uh, for example, paying a, which requires paying somebody to do it for you, they're called process servers. That's not the actual requirement under uh, Alaska um, state law and the Indian Civil Rights Act. So the next slide is an example of a notice code. It's kind of long, so I'm going to walk through it, but it's long for a, very, a reason. It's not meant to be complicated. It's actually meant to be helpful, and sometimes you have to write more to explain more. Um, so I'm going to walk through it step by step. So you have the whole code there. Um, I'll just read it. The clerk will provide a copy of the petition to the respondent. This is notice. 
Such service may be accomplished either by personally delivering the documents, so that's personal service, or by other means, such as registered mail, leaving the documents with a person at the respondent's residence who is believed to be a responsible adult. So it's not just dropping it off on the front door of their mailbox, but actually leaving it with a person who lives there. Publication in a newspaper that you know, the new, a type of newspaper that you know will be read throughout your informal communication methods, such as verbal notice, email, Facebook, or other social media, or posting in a public place in the community that you know people will actually see it. And then this next sentence is very important. As these other means, so all the ones we've just described, as long as those are reasonably designed in light of the circumstances to notify the respondent of the action. So we'll go through that piece by piece, because I know that was a lot. So next slide underlines the clerk. I underline this shows who's giving notice. The clerk. This code has decided that the clerk wants to give notice, not the um, party or anybody else. Yeah. The next slide underlines the respondent. I underline that because it shows who's being given notice to. It's the respondent, it's the person who's going to be affected by this case. The next slide underlines by personally delivering the document. That's one way to provide notice, personal service. And it tends to be a good way because, you know, there's like a confirmation that it was put in the hands of the person who needs it. But then the next slide underlines all the other means of doing that, as long as they're reasonably designed to notify the respondent. And I get that language reasonably designed from actual Alaska state law, uh, oh, excuse me, Alaska Supreme Court decision um, that say what is good enough notice. And you, we listed that this code listed all these examples because it wants to make sure that you know that there are many ways to provide notice as long as you think that they're good ways of notifying the person that the case is coming up. And that's kind of, you know, that's that's kind of a, a I don't know how to phrase this, but it's pretty straight. Like it, it seems confusing, but it, it, it should maybe be looked at less legally and more just in terms of common sense. How do we get this person to know that a case is opened up so that they can get involved? So the next slide, step five, is keeping good records of notice. It's important, and I, I would even recommend putting it in your codes, a requirement that the court clerk keep, document how notice was given, or as the you see the example here in the slide, the court clerk must file a proof of service with the travel court. So that, that is kind of the gold standard because that requires the clerk to file in the case, so it's in the case record, how that service was done and how it was done. The importance of this is to protect the tribal court decision from attack in state court. If, uh, if somebody doesn't like, if somebody who's part of the tribal court case doesn't like how it ended up and then goes and tries to challenge it in state court, if your tribal, that one of the first things that state court will do, it's going to check if due process happens, and a big portion of that is notice. And if you can pull a proof of service that was already filed in the tribal court case right there, easy, you would put that with your motion to dismiss the state court case and try to get rid of the state court case, saying, "Listen, we're the ones who decided this. We have the jurisdiction. Here's proof that we did everything." that we could and we met the right um, requirements to let that person know that the, he had a case in our tribal court. It makes it easy down the line um, and solves and prevents a lot of headaches. Um, so that's it. And I think I'm coming up right on my 15 minutes. Um, if you have questions, you can see uh, my email um, address on the last slide. Please feel free to reach out to me with questions. I'm absolutely happy to answer, and I'm happy to work on your code for 
answer your questions regarding your code, even if it's very specific, that's what I'm here for. I'm, um, I can provide that help um, to any uh, tribe around Alaska. So yeah, that's it. And uh, uh, Denise, did we want to do questions for all three of us at the end? We could do that. We have the time to do it, so I don't see why not. Okay, cool. Well, so that's my presentation. So um, yeah, like I said, email me if you have specifics, or I'm happy to uh, respond um, when it's the Q&A period for today. So does anybody have any questions for Clay regarding his presentation? So in writing um, the code, having each step written down help you keep better records? Uh, are you asking um, how how best to keep good records of notice in your tribal court? I mean, um, having to be specific like we did here in step one through step five. And do we, or is it already um, made up on how long we keep the records? Oh, that, well, that's a great question. I think um, it's up to you what kind of records you want to keep. Um, and it's up to you how long you want to keep them for. The reason to keep good records is what I mentioned before, which is it helps protect you from somebody in the case trying to open a case in state court and challenge the tribal court decision. It has other good, you know, it has other um, helpful um, benefits too, because cases tend to drag on. Cases close, but then they open again. Um, so keeping those records um, in a, you know, to, to whatever detail you want, it's up to you and however long you want is up to you. But um, it's, it's beneficial, especially with being able to keep things electronic if you have the cap capacity, um, keeping those for, um, for years. Um, would, would certainly be helpful, but that's up to you based on um, based on um, your sort of preferences with, with regard to protecting yourself and protecting the tribal court's decisions from challenge from outside. So we would write that in the step, uh, like on on the steps of. Uh, or in the code, or in as a step in the code. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think that's a great idea. Um, I kind of mentioned that when I said uh, on my step five, where just keep where where it said keeping good records. But right, so my example in step five, it says the court clerk must file a proof of service. So that's an example of putting it specifically in the code how to keep the record, and you keep the record by the clerk actually writing out and you can write a form for this to make it easy for the clerk but um which just says i you know notice was served by dot 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 and then you just fill in the specifics you file that in your tribal court case um and then it's and then it's in, included in the tribal court uh file um as long as the whole file is in existence so yeah i i think that's a great idea to um spell out in your code, how to keep um, how to keep records of the notice? Because again, the easier you can make it for your court clerk, the on the front end, the better it's all going to go on the back end, um, and and the more efficient and easier your travel court uh, will operate. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for Clay? Denise, this is Mary. Hi, Mary. Mary Go ahead. Hi. I just it, this isn't a question. I just wanted to um, give a friendly suggestion. Whenever we are entering dates, um, we need to make sure we put the year 
because it's surprising to me looking back at my old notes how often I don't, you know, I assume I'm going to remember what year things happened in, but especially like with legal actions, things can drag on for decades. So um, I just wanted to just reiterate that for some reason. Thanks for, thanks for saying that. Um, yeah, like it, it's, 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 it, it, we, I feel like we apply it in our own lives too, where it's just, um, it doesn't seem so important in the moment. And then you kind of, you know, you're, banging your head against the wall years down the line that you didn't add as much detail as possible. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Julia. Hi, Julia, go ahead. Um, when we give notice to a client or family or family member, um, there may be some inconsistency because of lack of resources or a high turnover rate of people that work for ECWA or for tribal court. Um, and I feel sorry for the individual that's trying to get help with their substance abuse problem, with um, not completing their treatment or not attending healthy family programs or not going to, uh, not fulfilling their, or, com or being compliant. And with the high rate of turnover, um, when, we, when there's a decision to how how to um, get help for this individual ends up uh, being in non-compliance. Uh, and then it has to go back to the court if the court referred. Um, I, I, that really bothers me. And then it comes up and um, is there... Is there something that people can do to prevent this thing from happening over and over? Because the individual was doing really good and then there's no more services. And with this COVID, this coronavirus is uh, making it very um, hard for that person to get their child back or going to treatment it just bothers me it can i'm very concerned because that i feel for that family i feel for that mother a single mother and um there should be some consistency or um not giving up so easily. So that's one yeah. of the things we had to bring up. Sure. Um, well, I think that one, okay, so uh, two things. Um, first, um, I appreciate um, how important um, your describing notice um, and and especially because tribal court is making a decision that affects people's lives. Um, and as I mentioned, if you'll look at the example code I put up there, I listed many different types of ways to give notice. Um, and so it doesn't all have to be one way. It just has to be the way that is going to work in these circumstances. Um, um, based on what you know about the person and what, um, you know, where they are generally or what they respond to or who they live with or interact with. Um, but a good way to deal with, and I'll let anybody else answer too if they have that, good ideas, but one good way to deal with some of the problems that you're discussing, like the high turnover rate, is to make 
note the notice requirement and all the possible ways of giving notice very clear in your court code, but then also drafting, writing up a form, like a template um, for the court clerk to use. And it's like, you know, and you can have all the different ways that they could possibly give notice listed on that form, almost like a, a checklist to make sure they tried everything, um, all the possible ways. And that way, if you have that form, if you, it's clear in the code and maybe you have a form for the clerk, then even as people come and go with the high turnover rate, regardless of who's in that position, there's the same code in the same form that they have to follow. Um, and that, that will tend to help with um, making it more consistent, but also making it easier because if a clerk doesn't have to do any guesswork, they just pull out the form for service, um, for notice, and um, look at all the options and check the box and explain which ones they did and which ones probably worked, um, then it doesn't matter so much who's doing it because they're just following a form. But I'll let others uh, answer if they have other good ideas. So I'm not hearing anything. Um, any 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 more questions for Clay before we move forward? Okay, so hearing the presentation for this John Robin will be Darlene Daniel. Can you hear me? I can hear you guys. Okay. On that UPIC uh, presentation, I just wanted to say I'm not going to read out the whole UPIC uh, wording on that. But it's uh, titled, You Beat Guns Hut Great Aden Ruet. And it describes how a leader is selected or how they work together. And they also mention the employees and how Slamio is mentioned in there too. And these leaders that were first selected when um, they first started having like a government, these were the people that wrote it first in the old Yupik writing, and then somebody wrote it down, and uh, our council got a hold of that wording and started writing it down in the newer version of the Yupik orthography. So we typed it up here at the court and some of the pieces are not clearly explained yet because we haven't really met with the elders. But I wanted to share this uh, Yupik written part because I wanted the other villages to know that it can be done in your language, and um, if you work with your elders, that could be done in your own language. And through, through on the first part, it mentions that the people that speak the same language will follow these these rules. They even mentioned that uh, subsistence, how they gather is in there, how the food is to be stored, how they are to dispose of the wasted food underground and not just scattered around, and how the land should be taken care of. Talk about the sun that caught in the ocean or on top the land in the rivers 
They also mentioned the seasons for gathering and other things. I, I don't know how to really explain this yagyaka. It's uh, how people deal with um like if a person died and the person was not allowed to go traveling for a year or forty days or something like that. That's what yagyaka is about to follow in the traditions. And after these are all proofread and make sure we have everything written down, they'll be presented to the village at the village meeting and read publicly maybe about three times and then on the third one they pass the, the bylaws. And that's what I wanted to say about these uh, ubiquitin bylaws that we have here, but they are not um, passed or it's not a final product of what was drafted. Doi. That's all I have to say on this, Denise. Thank you, Darlene. Um, does anybody have any questions for Darlene regarding her presentation? Can I ask a question? This is Mary Patola again. Hi, Mary. Darlene, when you were talking about um, like the rules and people yuck, or how did you say it? Yuck, yuck. Yuck, yuck. Okay. Um, how did you incorporate that into your codes? These words are all written down in what we got from the traditional old Yupik writing. Um, okay. The first elders that were in um, government, or some of them that had moved here, were the first people that wrote down these words, and some of them have already passed on. Okay, Rihanna. Are there any question any other questions or comments for Darlene? So hearing no more questions, um the next Can round you? rob Oh, go ahead. Exactly. Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to add a comment on Darlene, on Yogi Ock. Yeah, go ahead. You know, uh, I usually uh, talked with our elders here. I'm from Tuxup Bay. My name is Ben Charlie. And uh, I agree with her, but most likely on our in our area we have different beliefs. Regarding to uh, Yog Yog, and uh, each question I ask to an elder if this Yog Yog is part of our culture, and um, that I have a similar answers. So. Most likely, the way I understand, they're more religious toward our religion. Like Moravians have a uh, Yog Yog, uh, to respect their loss and the family member, each family members who are related to that person have to yuck at least about a year. Uh, but in my case, when I brought that uh, 
question and uh, the only answer I got from our, our elders here at Tuxuk, since we're Catholic, that there's uh, <clears throat> only uh, like at least about four to five days of uh, yuck, and that's it. So if that um, cold is pretty much finished, uh, can I... Uh, Change that yuck yuck in, in my own language, in my own coach. Good to hear you. Thank you. Oh, one my, last. Well, my Go question ahead. was the same as Ben, um, Denise. It's like, you know, in Bethel, it's such a melting pot of all of our region. And it seems like every family has a little bit different rules for grieving and mourning. So I'm not really sure if that would be incorporated into ONC. Is that, it's kind of like what, you know, it's like every tribe is very different. Yes, every tribe throughout our region is very different. And I wanted to point out that every every tribe is different and we follow our own traditional ways. And for our tribal courts, we really don't have to follow the state's um, wordings on our paperwork. We have our own um, tribal court forms and how we counsel the person is from the traditional counseling by the elders and we say we 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 are not following the state court procedures but we're following our own tribal court procedures. That's what I want to point out too. Well, no. Yes. And something to keep in mind is that, um, you know, we could go back to our traditional knowledge, and really it comes from our elders, but um, like Clay said, this can be, you know, they, they are your codes, they belong to your tribe, and they could be whatever you want it to be, as long as you are following um the requirements in the Indian, in the Indian Civil Rights Act. So I just wanted to state that as well. If there are no other comments or questions, I would like to move forward. So just one last check here. Are there any questions or comments? Hello, this is Julia. Hi, Julia. Hi, I really like this um, translation into our language and different language throughout Alaska, not only Alaska, but also uh, Lower 48, too. Um, I really like this incorporated to each different villages because each villages have their own personality and their own culture and their own trauma, historical trauma. And um, they have their own resources to um, abide by their lifestyle and to, and it's very family oriented place to where um, a non-native person um, don't understand the come into the religious and into a different culture and how we deal with our family. We we help one another and they don't understand that. They don't understand the, um, that we all share our knowledge and wisdom and we all help each other. And this is in a way to not 
have non-native or other culture impose their values and without understanding um, that we don't have all the luxuries, all the resources they have like in their own um, places or city where they come from. They may look at a child that's um, dirty and uh, may have torn clothes and they may look at a family that we are living in one little house and they have extended families that live there too. And right away, they stereotype the people that live like that as um, neglecting that child. And right away, they want to call OCS and um, do some um, check on that family. And right away, they want to take away the family, the, uh, the child. And using that example, um, I'm so glad that you you all are are doing a good job, and I'm so glad for Darlene. Um, her community is um, stepping up to the plate to protect us all, and not to have other people with their own values and beliefs imposed those upon us to live like them because we don't we 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 don't know we don't know how how to live like that and they think that we're not uh, just because we don't have credential or um title or position that um we, we don't know how to take care of the family and the community that's what i i wanted to mention Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I, I appreciate that because, you know, we, we do know our own. We do know our family. And, you know, what I was thinking of while you were talking was, you know what, maybe this family just came back from fish camp or berry camp or camping. Um, you know, it. We, we know our own better than anybody else. And for this reason is why our code should include our culture. So if there are no other questions, the next person in our round robin is Winter Montgomery. She doesn't have presentation material today, but she will she will go ahead and start now. Hello again. Uh, this is Winter Montgomery. I we're running short on time, but I, I just want to go over my part of the presentation where is uh, going over some tips for creating your first code. So uh, yesterday I talked about different questions uh, to kind of prepare for that. And the first question is what, what, what kind of code do you need? Is it a regular code or just one uh, smaller ordinance or a shorter code? Next, um, if you're going to draft it by yourself, uh, what, do you, um, what do you need or do you need outside assistance? Uh, to finish it, and then what? And the third question is, what's the timeline to to get it done? So, you know, keep those things in mind, and then start with. Uh, and I just thought we'll just uh, throw out an example. So, sometimes codes can be very long and very detailed, and there's positive and negatives for both. So, if you have a broad code, then uh, you give room for more uh, broad interpretation and, and procedure. Sometimes courts that are have been like the traditional courts we're talking about have been doing things for so long it might not be written down but they they know what how uh, to do the procedure uh, already even if it's not all written down. Part of the benefit of it down is so the future generations will have like the specific guidelines where the elders aren't here anymore, but also uh, just valid to. Uh, continue the oral tradition, if, if they still can uh, pass down those traditions, you could keep the code broad. Uh, for instance, the first part of the code, 
you want to put a purpose. What is this code for? So an example uh, for juvenile wellness. So let's talk about starting a juvenile wellness code. Uh, the next part would be uh, the substance. So what is going to be, um, what happens as part of this juvenile code? So it could be as simple, you know, there's a, a complaint that the juvenile has uh, committed an act that violates, you know, one of the minor offense codes or or another part of traditional codes. Um, and I've seen um, uh, one tribe, they have a specific uh, code when you're disrespectful to elders. So let's say uh, this code is similar about juvenile wellness and uh, addressing uh, how uh, juveniles treat elders uh, in the community. So uh, part of it would be the substance. And as I said, it could go, you know, A, disrespect to elders, B, distra, um, violating uh, tribal law, C, you could break it out like that. It could be a narrative. It could be a paragraph that says this, the, you know, after you put the purpose for juvenile wellness, then the substance, this code is to address juvenile behavior such as, and then list a lot of uh, items that are going to be covered in the code. The next part of it would be the procedure. And that's when it could be as simple as when someone files a complaint with the tribal court and they decide to hear it, you know, there's going to be a notice of hearing, you know, as Clay was talking about, it will be sent to all parties involved. Everyone will have notice and the opportunity uh, to be addressed. Uh, the traditional um, court will commence. Everybody will have an opportunity to speak. You know, you've seen some traditional codes that say whoever, um, like for the circle healing, whoever holds the the stick is the person that talks and you have to pass um, pass it to have your opportunity. You can put uh, the procedure that's going to be followed uh, as long as it uh, includes the uh, due process and that's just the, the notice opportunity to be heard for people that have an interest in the case. And then a mechanism of how the court will come to a decision and what um, options are available. And some codes, like I said, can be pages long, but this is the tips of if you want to do something um, and you have a short time frame, but you want to know how to kind of split it up to make sure that it's enough to be um, followed by the court. And if you have a broad language, you could say even in procedure, you can put a few specific procedures, but you know, then the catch-all that I, uh, I see tribes put uh, is, and other um, issues to be handled by traditional custom. Something, you know, you can add that catch-all language. Uh, and like I said, some people say, no, you should make it as specific as possible, so there's no, um, I think that's what we see more in the Western, is like it has to be so specific because people will just fight over what it really means, but I, I just don't, it seems like tribal courts aren't as adversarial, they're not, fighting, they really are looking for solutions. So I think that broad language uh, in the code is okay as long as when it's put in there, follow traditional customs, people know what that means. And I think uh, most part of the tribes, they know what that means and they have, uh, they have the way of doing things, even if it's not written down, but that kind of gives it the language of, of uh, the broad language of what uh, the tribal court has authority to do by saying they will follow the, the custom. So I always think that's a good practice tip if you are trying to create something on a limited amount of time. So that's my presentation. I just wanted to kind of throw out some tips for people that are kind of in a time crunch that wanted to, to, to see uh, how to put uh, even a, a juvenile code or any kind of uh, code together on a on a quick basis. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments for any of the presenters? Um, 
We are at the very end of our session today, so I'm opening the floor for any questions or comments that any of the participants may have. Hello? Hi. Hi, uh, this is Jennifer from Gusset Look. Um, I have a question for maybe Winter. When we do a order grant custody through tribe and we succeed and get that going and then the last where we get stuck is the um since it's not included in the children's code or it might be we might be missing that part. Um the child child support disputing on who gets and how how would we um, get that going like if they ask for child support? Do we just send out the whole case document to the state so it could be processed faster? Okay, so the thanks for your question. So the the children's code has child custody uh in it and then the the way that child support and this is probably a good idea, maybe this is something we should add. Uh child support is basically decided uh, based on the custody arrangement. So if one parent has the child like eighty percent of the time, then there's a certain calculation of how much the other person owes. Um so uh We'll have to tribe. think on that. The, the, the actual, oh, sorry. Does the tribe um, decide on that, or do we just send out the uh, case to the state child support people? You can send your certified order to, um, uh, I'm sorry, it's the, it was in a C, or it's CSSB or something. Um, the Division of Child Support for the State of Alaska, and then they, if based on the certified order and the amount of custody that was granted to the custodial parent, then they can figure it out based on the the state calculation. And then when we do that, um, they say they want to see the original state court case. Um, even though they should we are federally recognized, we get stuck to that part most of the time. So certified tribal order should should be sufficient, but if they, uh, you can get a state enforcement order, like enforcing the, the tribal court order, if they're looking for something from the state, but they shouldn't need it. But message me after this, because we should make sure that you get an answer. I had another issue that was similar where for vital statistics, you know, they sent a, they're trying to get the cha the birth certificate for one of the tribal members for an adoption, and then they said they had to fill out one form, uh, and so they filled it out and also included the tribal court order, and then they were saying, no, we want a state order, you know, so sometimes they're just, uh, don't know the full process, so we've been following up on that uh, as well. So there's, there are a few hiccups sometimes. If that happens, just reach out to us because that's what I did with Vital Statistics. I just called them up. Okay, how do we get this fixed? How do we, um, why aren't you recognizing the tribal court order and stuff? And we, we come to find common ground of how to get the issue resolved. So we're here to help with those issues. Okay. Are there any more questions or comments for our presenters? Um, hello. Hi. Yeah, uh, could we cite um, public law in our order as per public law, I don't know, 280 or something? Um, like if we send something to child support or if somebody, you know, to... So the state agencies, whoever they are, they probably know what uh, public law 
is if we cite it. Could would that help in the orders? Do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. Yes, I mean the order. Uh, usually, the first thing that we recommend in the order is to have a jurisdictional statement which says, you know, the villa, the tribal village of blank has jurisdiction based on, and then uh, there's boxes to check us. Um, and it will say, you know, that it deals with a, a child, a tribal member, uh, the incident occurred. Um, in our community. So it basically says uh, in the very beginning of the order, uh, it's recommended to say why the tribal court has jurisdiction, which establishes to the state agencies, we have jurisdiction of this issue. Um, and we're able to make a, a ruling and it be uh, enforced. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to put enforcement language um, there that you have jurisdiction and the reason you have jurisdiction and then reference a, a, a state law or that you have concurrent jurisdiction with the state and that because you're acting, you know, this order is, is valid and binding the same way it would be if it was issued by a state court. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. So, last call for any comments or questions to our presenters. It could be anything, you know, off of the top of your head. It doesn't have to be relevant to the training. Um, any questions at all are welcome. Mm -hmm. Just open Hello? Hello? Uh, Denise? Sorry, I had to go through and find find who to mute. I can hear you. <laughs> uh, this is Gladys, Hooper Bay Travel Court. Hi, Gladys. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I was having a problem uh, with the survival benefit deal thing. Um, you know, I was trying working working with this family. The parents were um, uh, the parents had custody of the children since birth, and the mother, um, you know, she was out drinking, and the uh, the other parent, you know, he's diseased, and the survival benefits. Uh, the parents were the parents really wanted it, wanted them to transfer transfer the survival benefits from the biological mother, but we were stuck. I was stuck with that because the biological mother, she'd been drinking and she didn't want to comply. So we had to let it go and um, tell the grandparents to call um, uh, Anchorage, uh, Anchorage, uh, try, try to uh, uh, transfer the survival benefits to them. Um, is it, is it, um, is it, is it, is it tribal courts, uh, can tribal courts, um, do the same thing, you know, transfer, transfer, transfer the survival benefits to the mother? I mean, to the parents that's been taking care of the children? And I got stuck with the survival, you know, the biological mother is receiving the, benefits and she's not um, spending it to the children and she's spending it on her own and the grandparents wanted it to get transferred to them and uh, the biological mother wasn't even complying so we put it on hold. So I'm still on hold on that. Is it okay if travel cards can do that? Um, transfer the benefit, survival benefits? So this, this is Winter. Is... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead, Winter. Okay. We actually had a similar issue in a, in a different tribe that, uh, similar to that. So there's different ways. Yes, the short intro is yes, the tribal court can do something, but there are some barriers, and that is, in the eyes of the law, the mother 
is still the mother. I understand that, base, you know, you keep calling, you know, the people that are raising the children, they really are the parents, even though she's the biological mother. But the way that the, the, the in the eyes of the law, which is more of the Western state version, is she's the mother. So until that's designated differently, she's going to get the benefit. There are different ways to do it. And that is, you can, the, the tribe can help the parents, uh, talk to the mom and come to an agreement, you know, outside of court, just that says, hey, we're, we love these children, we're raising them, uh, can we have uh, the survivor benefit, we're going to use it for their clothes and their food to help them um, the way that uh, we hope, you know, that that's how it's supposed to be used. Uh, can we get an agreement that you're going to transfer us the money uh, when you get it, or even 80% of it, or, or some kind of agreement. That's kind of the way to do it outside of the court, but you can use the assistance of, of uh, tribal mediators or, or someone to help. Uh, the next could be that the mother signs a delegation of parental power. So it's not a full adoption, but it's basically saying, uh, it's usually good for a year that they're delegating their their um, responsibilities uh, as a parent to another person. So that document could be used to get the, the benefit. Um, you could do, I mean, it, it all depends what the mom wants to do, but if she's open to an adoption, even if she wants things to be the status quo, but if she's willing to do a cultural adoption through the tribal court, so that way that do, those documents can be, um, sent to vital statistics and then the, the children would get a new uh, birth certificate that says the parents that are raising the children will be on the birth certificate if the uh, adoption goes through and then that that can be used to receive the benefit. The last case scenario is something in, that I caution the other tribe. I don't know if, um, if they want to do something like that, but that's you. someone could file a petition that the uh, of child protection, you know, that the mother is not providing for the children, that she's kind of abandoned them or not uh, taking care of them, then it would open a child protection case in the tribal court. And then at that point, she would have to decide if she's going to take the children or adopt them or, you know, worse, like terminate her rights. You know, that's the last case scenario. Uh, and I just don't think that a lot of tribes really want to go down that route. Kind of like you I already mentioned, you know, there's this issue, but you kind of put it, you'd rather put it on hold than kind of rush to like a really aggressive um, route of trying to um, uh, do that. So that is an option, but like I said, that's kind of the last case scenario. I would try to uh, talk, get just get the mom uh, to have a conversation. I know it sounds like they've already had them, but maybe bring an outside party or an elder or someone that they could meet and come to an agreement about her transferring the benefit. I think that's the best way. Uh, but if she's unwilling and the parents are really having a hard time uh, providing for the children, uh, then then maybe adoption or delegation of powers, uh, parental powers. So those are some of the options. But follow up with an email to me because we can work through it. Uh, but yeah, this isn't... this. Like I said, this has happened in a different, um, in a different tribe too. So it's been an issue that that pops up sometimes. Okay. I have, I have a question. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, what what we are doing now is trying to um, do we have the case in court and have it trans is in the process of transferring it to the tribe. And once the tribe receive the case, we'll get, they're going to um, have the gar guardianship to the brother or the relative, and then um, have that relative apply for the benefits. Hi, Denise, you hear me? Hi, I can hear you. Um, I have a question for that Tuber B. Did they do an order granting custody for those grandchildren by the grandparents? 
Uh, yes, they did. Um, we meet with the tribal council, and uh, we made an agreement, but the mother, biological mother, wasn't complying, and everything was on hold. We filled out, you know, we suggested them to do adoption, and then, um, and then uh, we... We suggested him to do adoption, but um, she wanted to put him on hold because she she was you know stuck with the biological mother. Uh, she needed to talk to her, but she was she was having hard time, and to this day she still is having hard time. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we we had a similar situation where the children's social security benefits were going to the mother and the mother would take them and leave town and then spend it any which way she wanted and be gone for months. And then we had a custody hearing and the custody was given to a different person besides the parent and how they were trying to get the money for their social security was they called that Anchorage office and they told him that he needs to go to that office in person and bring that custody form so they could change that um, where the money would go to for the children. So that's how that situation was solved by going to them directly and when that person did have any airfare, um, the tribe had unrestricted funds to help pay for his fare and help him out. So that's how the situation got solved for us. Okay. Well, what I told him was if you guys, you know, if the, uh, if the grandparents, you know, if they have any kind of appointment to go to Anchorage, um, I I suggest them to go to the Anchorage office by themselves because that's what they told me when I first um, when I first tried to help them with the survival benefits. Yeah, that's the best way to go about. Yeah. Okay. So I just have to state right here that um, this is why collaboration between our tribal courts is great because maybe something happened in a different court that, um, you know, is going on in your court right now and maybe they have ways of handling it so you're not hitting that roadblock and that you're able to move forward and progress with your case. Um, are there any last comments or questions for any of our presenters? Hello. This is Daisy May. Hi, Daisy May. Hi. I do have my last comments for presenters and the staff. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are times I've been challenged during the uh, training. I have water in my eardrum. And if I'm too loud, it's not my intention to be loud. It's because I can't hear. But I do have closing comments. I, I would like to appreciate and extend my appreciation to each and every presenter and staff member for a wonderful, thorough process explaining the importance and the purpose of a tribal court and what I come out of this is the importance of government-to-government -government relationships to be established and how we can work together as government-to-government -government as a tribal court versus state court. And it develops team building with many resources. I, I, I heard mentions of some resources from each presenter and the importance of the documentation process and how we can embrace the process in order to protect our tribal courts and our tribal members. And the interaction of all cultures, establishing a system 
so that we can be prepared for any transferring of any cases, be it China case, ICWA case, or a criminal case. I would like to ask if it's possible for someone to submit a listing of all the resources that was mentioned these three days. It's difficult to remember each resource that was mentioned because this training with its challenges, um, be it via phone, has been a high caliber pressure for me. But through it all, we pulled through together as a court family unit, and I'm very appreciative of that. My last closing comment, I would like to seek and ask if there can be another training established or developed or prepared and planned specifically on the issue of how we as tribal courts can go through the process of any criminal cases that might be transferred from state court to the tribal court. Thank you very much for allowing the speaker to speak. May God bless you. Thank you, Daisy May. I really appreciate those comments. And um, you're asking about training and something that we really welcome from our participants is ideas regarding what trainings you would like from us because really we put these trainings on for you we want to help our communities in our region we want to help you in what you have to do to keep your keep your community and keep your people safe so i i really do appreciate those comments and we will i will likely myself reach out to you to get ideas for training that you might need <laughs> um are there any mm-hmm. other oh go ahead this is Mary Peltola again. Um, I really appreciated the question from the other judges in the, uh, from other tribes because you guys are further away. I mean, I'm brand new, so all of this is new to me. And one of the things I'm wondering is if, you know, at some point there could be like a monthly call or, you know, once every two months where we could just call each other and just share, you know, share frustrations and strategies for solving problems. Well, that is a great idea, Mary. I appreciate it. I appreciate the input. Um, our our staff is definitely noting that, and it's actually something that I've thought of before, but I didn't know how well it would be received. And then in the midst of the pandemic we're in right now, um, you know, it, it's even more important to have that that collaboration between between tr- different tribal courts and different communities. So I, I will I, I will um, we're going to be vetting that. Are there any question? Any other questions or comments? Uh, hello. Hi, go ahead. Yeah, um, if you have a list of um, tribal court phone numbers and contact people of um, of the other tribes, you know, if we have a dilemma or something, maybe you could email their court contact information. So actually we were working on um, an updated tribal court survey, and we are getting contact information, but we're gonna have to make sure that it's okay to share because that is not our our department's information, it belongs to the tribe, but definitely we'll look at what we can do for that. Yes. So my clock right here is showing 301. I just want to be sure that everybody got their questions and comments answered. And if you did not, if you're shy um, <laughs> for any reason, if you have a question or comment, feel free to reach out to us at the, the Tribal Justice Department. Our, our email address is tribal-justice at abcp.org. Our department phone number is 543-8550. Um, and 
if, if you're interested in reaching out to any of our presenters, I have contact information, and it sounds like everybody is pretty open to being contacted, and I know everybody is very helpful. Um, so if you do, you know, I just want to... I just want to send out a reminder that um, I did include the training evaluation for this specific training in the program material that was sent out. And if everybody could fill that out and send it back to us via email, we'll be sure to look through all the input and make sure that your concerns or anything are being addressed um, in regard to the trainings that we are hosting for you. Um, this is the conclusion of our AVCP Master Series Training Part 2. We had about 40 people on the phone today, so that's great. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us, and we really appreciate your participation throughout the training and throughout our trainings in the past. Um, our department is here to support you and to help you throughout your anything related to tribal court you know, as much as possible. Um, so I, I, I set out the reminder for the training evaluation. Um, I really wanted to thank our presenters on behalf of the Tribal Justice Department. Um, they really bring a lot of great resources and knowledge to, to the table and to everybody, all the participants. Um, and I, I do want to say that our participants, you, you guys each know your communities the best and you know how things work and we appreciate you taking the time to join us. So with that, um, I, I just want to say that our, our trainings, the recordings of these trainings will be available on the AVCP website. Um, if you're having a hard time finding that, please reach out to me. I'm available to help. And just thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Brianna. Thank you. Brianna. 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 Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Safe one. You too. Stay safe out there. Hmm. <laughs> Heather, it's only me and you on the phone now. <laughs> and you're muted. I'm going to call the group. Uh, I'll, I'll call you guys on the cell phone. Okay, bye.